On NBC's This Is Us, Jack Pearson saves his family, but not himself. A look at all the choices Jack made in the fire. Ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. Today, we're talking about fire, real and in the movies, with Professor Glenn Corbett of John Jay College's Department of Fire and Emergency Management. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Faith. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me. So in general, what do movies and TV shows get, get right about fire, and what do they get wrong? You know, I, I think the, the, the movies get and the, the shows get the uh, the uh, perhaps the immediacy the the danger those kind of things I think come out pretty pretty easily you know out of out of the um, what's being filmed or what's what's being shown on film but on the other hand um, most of the stuff that I, I watch um, you know of course I talk back to the TV and go let's just like not possible okay this is like <laughs> not realistic and for the most part that's kind of the realm that they end up in. And there are a lot of things that unfortunately really don't happen as we see them on TV. And for example, so, like, for example, one of the most obvious things is smoke, right? So, you know, smoke actually, um, from a, from a, uh, lethality standpoint is the most dangerous thing in a fire. Most people die of smoke inhalation. They don't, uh, they may be, right, death. exactly. They're not burned to death. They actually die of smoke inhalation. And in a real fire, you can't see your hand in front of your face. I mean, that's the realistic fire in most. So that cases. would be very challenging to film. It for would a TV be because you can't see or, anyone. Yeah, okay, exactly. so it would be great to have a black screen and yelling and banging and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know that doesn't doesn't gravitate. People don't gravitate right. to that. They want to see somebody running through a fire and things. So the fact that you can't see it, you know, is thrown out the window when it comes to you know to the drama part of this. So. So today, we want to take a look at one very specific fictional right. fire. Right. This was the fire heard round the world, or at least the country, right. on season two of the hugely successful NBC drama, This Is Us. We see the fire that killed Jack Pearson. Glenn, all right, let's take a look at this fictional fire in chronological order. Right. First, we got the crock pot. Right. Okay, at the end of the previous episode, Jack and Rebecca's elderly neighbor gives the young couple a crock pot that's right. just a couple of years old, right. but already has a faulty switch. Right. Flash forward 18 years, and that faulty switch sparks. Right. The sparks become a flame. Glenn, scientifically, what makes a spark and what makes a spark become a flame? You know, something like a crock pot where the wiring may be old and where the wiring is perhaps uh, the insulation's being lost. Uh, inside the crock pot or the connections particularly that's the most important one the connections between the wires to the control feature of the crock pot when you have problems of connections there that creates resistance electrical resistance which is actually results in heat and of course that's where you get uh, a high enough amount of energy going through there that's where you end up generating large amounts of heat and of course the fire will break out from that so it's not even so much it's a spark per se per se it's more of a heating up of Again, that electrical component of that of that crock pot. The fire in the Pearson's crock pot jumps to the red dish towel where right. Jack once hit a diamond bracelet for right. Rebecca. Right. And then it spreads from the dish towel to the curtains and then it seems to actually eat the Pearson's kitchen. And the scene is shot in this wonderfully, terrifyingly emotional way that makes it seem like the fire is really consuming the Pearson family's life. It is. Does a fire actually eat everything in its path? Yeah, I mean, you could describe it that way. Um, I mean, one thing about fires also is that as they develop, they typically develop exponentially, meaning that, you know, it's not sort of this, this gradual linear process. It actually, it starts to accelerate basically as it develops it doubles and doubles in size over and over again. So when you look at the kitchen fire, you look at the fire spreading from the crock pot to something logical like a towel or something like that. Curtains. Right, and curtains and things like that. It's not, that's certainly within the realm of possibility that it can spread from that, of course, onto the wooden kitchen cabinets. And of course, this is all fuel, basically. Is it eating it? Yes, it's, it's you know, it's, it's creating, uh, you know, the fire is actually consuming the fuel, right? It's actually, literally breaking it down chemically 
and producing flames and toxic gases and all those other kind of things, right? So, so yeah, you could describe it as eating it, I guess, as, as a way you could look at it, right? But that's exactly what happens. And I think that part of the program is, is, uh, is realistic. I, I think that's something that, uh, again, I think the takeaway for this from, from, in the real world is that fires can develop very, very quickly. I mean, yeah. that's probably the biggest thing here is that most people think there's like minutes and minutes and minutes to deal with this. And again, since it grows exponentially, you don't have minutes and minutes to deal with situations like this. At the end of Unlucky episode 13, the kitchen fire is heading up the stairs to the Pearson's bedrooms like like a serial killer. It's right. like stalking an innocent family and it's right. wildly dramatic and terrifying. Right. How the heck does a film crew control a fire like that? Well, that, and this is probably the point at which it sort of changes over to perhaps the more unrealistic uh, situation here. Um, most fires uh, on movie sets or, or TV programs and things like that, to control it, they use gas jets basically behind things. So you actually, they can increase the height of the, of the flame, wow. reduce the height of the flame, sort of, and as, as we said before, this lack of smoke, okay? Because the flames are what, smoke is not what people think about fire. They think flames and stuff. So yeah. flames is danger. Smoke is not so much maybe. And so seeing the flames getting larger and larger and spreading things like that, that sort of, you know, this timeline, people, oh my God, it's getting worse, it's getting worse, somebody's gonna get hurt here, that kind of thing. In the next episode, Jack Pearson wakes up next to Rebecca, throws open their bedroom door, and it's a wall of fire. And this guy, played by Milo Ventimiglia, he's like superhero dad. He's calm, he's ready, he's moving. Right. How important was it that Jack is so calm and active um, during the fire? Well, he, it's great that he's calm and he's yelling at his daughter over there to stay where she is. Now, of course, you notice no smoke in there again, so she, he can see her across, even though there's... So is that totally unrealistic? Totally unrealistic, okay, oh. totally unrealistic. So he could see her. Now, of course, you know, the, it always begs these questions. So, like, you know, how come they didn't have a working smoke detector, right? So that's a takeaway for safety for, for your program here is that... Working smoke detectors save lives. I mean, yeah. we've literally cut the number of fire fatalities down uh, by more than half in the last 20 years because of, probably because of the introduction of smoke detectors and better fire prevention. So that's a really good thing. There's no smoke detector here. So all of a sudden they wake up, they open the door, of course. He probably wouldn't be able to open that handle on that door. If there's that much fire out there, he couldn't open that door ah. handle, okay? You know, which is usually metal. They're always metal, right? Yeah. Ow! It yeah. And of course, you know, there's some wrong things that are going on here. I mean, he shouldn't be telling his daughter, I'm going to come and get you, because it's the worst thing he could have done is to actually go across the hallway here in the middle of this open stairway. What should stairway. he be telling his daughter? He said, go to the window, close the door and go to the other window that she has in her bedroom and stuff and uh, wait until the fire department gets there or he gets outside or someone gets there and gets a ladder. For so him, Jack so. tells his wife, Rebecca, to go to the bathroom in wet towels. Yeah. How important are wet towels? Well, in, the, in, the, in the, this kind of house fire that we have here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest people do that because it's wasting time getting out. If you were trapped in a building, like a high rise, for example, we do tell people to try to seal off the doorways, vents and things like that with wet towels to try to prevent smoke from getting in. But in this case, this is a wood frame house that's, you know, it's, it's not gonna last that long in this fire. And to tell people to waste time doing that, their, their focus should simply be to get the get heck out. out. Right, that's it. The, the Pearsons famously have these three kids. They're, right. they're triplets of a fashion. Right. And Jack right. heads out of the room to wake up his son, Randall. Right. He makes Randall stay so low to the right. ground that he can, uh, that on the trip back, it's, it's, he can hardly walk. Like, right. It's, right. he's that low. Right. Wouldn't it have been better if Jack just kind of stood up and, and had, had run faster so they could get everybody out? Well, that's actually, that's a good thing to do is crawling on the floor okay. because the cleanest place during a fire in terms of smoke, heat, what have you, is at the floor level, okay? That's actually, we do, firefighters do the same thing. I mean, we crawl through buildings for the most part. I mean, once you get into the air where the fire's burning and stuff like that, you're not walking into that environment. You're actually on your hands and knees, basically, moving a hose line or, or searching for people, whatever you're doing. So by Are there having not him go- flames on the ground? No, 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 it's all up above you. So of course, fire burns to, some, to the most part up and out, basically. It doesn't typically, it can, but it doesn't typically burn down. So your floor level, that's, if, if you're gonna survive, that's where you gotta be. So, okay, so even if you're face right up at the carpet level, and, got it right, and just that's, crawl as fast that's as the best thing to do if you ever have to do that. I mean, the point is that going out into that hallway and that it's center open stairwell and stuff was the most dangerous thing he ever did, encouraging 
the, the girl to that wait over there, I'm going to come and get you, and then the boy to come through that same area. It's not as that wouldn't that wouldn't be something you want to suggest. But to as somebody. a parent, right? Your right. First, your first and only instinct is go to my children, make sure they're safe. Agreed. But the point is, is that you can endanger them by doing what he did. So you would want to yell. They yeah, couldn't see you. You'd close your door. Yell. Go to the window. That's the bottom line. Go to the window. And of course, nobody's calling the fire department in the midst of all this, right? We don't even know this in the program. Who called the fire department, right? Right. We don't know who did that because there's, there's no cell. I mean, this is cell phone days. I mean, we thought that one of them would have called 911 immediately. So they got the help coming, basically. And then again, sort of try to migrate out of the house in the safest way possible, which is not down through that stairwell. <laughs> I have to tell you, this whole discussion is, right. I'm feeling very, like, it's very uncomfortable to even talk about yeah, it. Like, yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, this is second nature to you to, yeah. to know what to do, but the, yeah. even imagining the scenario is terrifying. It is. It is. And the thing is, is that, unfortunately, when you have programs like this, we hope that it doesn't rub off on people that they've got plenty of time and they can run through hallways and be the Superman and stuff like that. That's not realistic. That's so there's not. no real heroism to being a hero in a fire, right? It's just get doing the right out. thing. It's the right thing. And of course, having a plan ahead of time. We don't know that they ever had a plan either. Right? Again, it's the time element and the speed at which a fire spreads is, is it doesn't give you a lot of time to like make all sorts of decisions and try different things. So when Jack opens that bedroom door again, yes. the fire is bigger, yes. hotter, yes. meaner. Yes. He gets to his daughter's room and his Katie girl go. is right. terrified and right. he puts a, a wet towel over her head and he actually spends some precious seconds trying to calm her down. Right. Okay, so let's talk about time right. and terror. Right. How fast does a fire spread? Well, you know, fire, we're talking minutes, not even hours here, and I'm talking single digit minutes, right? So it's not like you, I mean, you can have a fire smoldering for a while, but once it gets into flaming combustion, like we saw the crock pots on fire now, you're talking two or three, four minutes tops bef between the time of that thing starting to the time it's upstairs already spreading through the house. So that's why, again, smoke detectors are really important here because it'll pick it up in the first minute or so. And, oh, my God, something's burning. Then we can get out of the house space. And that still may mean even then not going down the stairs and maybe going out the windows, but calling 911 right away, getting everybody together and getting the heck out. How dangerous is terror? It is um, because, you know, it's unfortunate that um, people... I, I guess, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but there are, we study fire fatalities and things. What we sometimes find is that people sort of revert back into some kind of primal type of uh, survival mode and stuff. I mean, you can't, I can't tell you how many times where we've, uh, again, across the country and all these fires find people in bathrooms, for example, in the bathtub thinking there's water and water and bathtubs will save them kind of thing. Yeah. And that's happened over and over again. Children, for example, we very often have, when we do teach search operations uh, for firefighters, go new closet. firefighters, they go to the closet or under the bed. So these are things that we oh. we train on to expect those things to happen, right? So, but again, the time thing is, again, this is maybe the worst part of these TV shows and movies and stuff where people think there's like this, like, like, 10 or 15 minutes kind of thing that we're dealing with here. It's not. In realistic uh, terms, it really isn't. So. Okay, so in the drama, Katie's window is too far from the ground, yes. and they've got to get back to the room with access to the front porch roof. Right. They open the door. It's impassable, but Jack does not panic. He grabs his daughter's mattress. He strips off the sheets, and he's on his way. Now, I would think that the mattress would be super flammable, or did he make a good choice? It is. Um, if he was going to do that, he probably should use the door, actually, but he couldn't take the door off. But. Um, but again, it's it's totally unrealistic to think that he's going to walk through this path of fire from from the one bedroom across that open stairwell. Uh, he could never make it, okay? And that that mattress isn't going to do him any good. All it's going to do is basically slow him down. And you know, most people have you ever tried to grab a mattress? They're not the easiest no. thing to handle either. Okay? I can't even change a crib sheet. <laughs> no. So it's not the easiest thing to handle, and it's like a barrier. Okay, it's it's some uh, whoever the script writer thought this was like a, a shield against the fire and stuff. It is combustible. It'll burn. There's no question about it. And so, but the thing is, he couldn't even have been in that environment in the first place and survive that. Certainly going across first and then coming back. Okay, again. so let me ask you: When you were watching this yeah. episode, were you sitting? Were you just sitting at home going, "Oh, come on"? Talking to the TV, yeah, Were you? I, I was. It, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. <laughs> so yeah. is this is this dangerous? Is this kind well, of misinformation, mis drama, dangerous? This is something where where these shows could do a really good 
benefit public service. to public service by putting a 45 or 60 minute clip at the end to throw in smoke detectors, plan, crawl, the whole bit, crawl the, all that stuff to do it very quickly. You know, because oh, you mean 60 seconds. Yeah, at, 60, the, end, at yeah. the end of the program to just go over yeah. this and say, look, this what we showed you here was a drama. This is not a real fire. He didn't get killed because he's an actor and it was a gas fed fire that we controlled. I mean, all those kind of things. They should say that and then say, look, in a real fire, you don't have the benefit of time. You need that early detection. You need to have a plan in place. If you do end up having to get out of the house, you know, this is the way you do it. And of course, call 911. All those kind of things that should, you could build that into like a segment yeah. at the end that's much more realistic. This fire scene in This yes. Is Us takes about four minutes of screen right. time from the discovery of the fire to everyone right. standing on the roof of the porch. Right. Is that about how much time? Was that realistic? That, that is realistic from that standpoint. You'd have that um, much time to get you out. You would. It, it, but again, it's, it's, you know, people. People have to remember it's you know it's all over in five minutes basically. And a fire once the fire goes in open, like you can have a smoldering fire, smoldering fire. But once it gets into what we call open flaming or the, we call the incipient stage, um, that's when um, that's when it's off to the races basically. And I remember I said earlier this is when it gets like this sort of if you looked at it on a graph, it goes faster, faster, faster. It accelerates exponentially basically that's the way fires develop they don't they don't grow like take their time and grow they grow exponentially so so jack's got the kids and right. the wife safely right. on the ground they're going to live that's good that's good and he then the runs dog back barks in. he runs back in again and yes he goes back into the burning house not because he loves the dog but because he loves the girl who loves the dog and loves the and after just one minute of terror oh i can't watch it after one minute of terrifying screen time Jack emerges heroic with an armful of dog and family okay, what else? photo albums. Photo albums and stuff. He knows to go in there. There's no possibility, okay, in the real world this is ever going to happen, okay? It's just not going to happen, okay? Number one is you never go back into a house once you're out, okay? Never. Never, ever. Um, wait till the guys, the gals, the firefighters show up there with the protective clothing and go in and get whatever you have to get. And if a you firefighter know. did show up, Yes. I imagine if I said, please go save my photos, you'd be like, no, lady. No, photos, sorry. no, but pets we do, of course, pets and, of course, people. Of course. So, I mean, that's that's the other thing, too, is that these fires occur 2 o'clock in the morning. People, the, their, their minds aren't quite registering and things. So you got to remember that you don't always know. We, we never assume, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning, we never assume everybody's out. We're going to go in looking for people. We're going to find the mom or the dad and say, look, is everybody out? Count them. Stand them all right here. Make sure they're all there. Oh. But on the same token, we're never going to, we're always going to search anyway because you never know. Things happen. A, a friend, a kid's friend is over for the night or whatever. We always need to make sure of that. So, but this scenario of him going back in, a is a mistake to do it anyway. So that's the big takeaway. Don't ever do that because you'll get killed. I, I, was, I did a, I investigated, uh, help look at a fire in Kentucky in a nightclub in the 70s. Two women got out of this nightclub fire, killed 165 people. Of those 165, two of them died because they went back and they forgot the money from the fundraiser they were going to. They went back into the building and they died because of that. So this happens a lot because people have, you know, they're emotional and stuff. They, but they don't, again, they don't connect the reality of science and this fire right. to being easily killed in a situation like that. So didn't happen, should never go back into the house. And the reality of him walking into a building, there's flames showing out of every window. Okay, he doesn't have Kevlar skin. It's not going to happen. Okay, so that's totally unequivocal. Well, when you say it's not going to happen, someone he would could die. do that. But he would he die. Would get he 10 would feet into the house. And, and be on fire. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. So... All right, so by the end of this episode, right. Glenn, he ends up in, the in all households all over the world, people are sobbing right. because Jack Pearson is dead. But he, but he, right, so the fire had been put out, the kids were safe, Jack was at the hospital for a burn on his arm at the end, and then suddenly he dies of this massive heart attack brought on by smoke inhalation, and all across America, people are wondering, you know, how, why? Right. So Glenn, right. How? Right. Why? how, why? Why did Jack Pearson have to die? So, so in the real world, if someone, we, let's say we rescue someone and they've, you know, had a lot of smoke inhalation, right? So that, what is the smoke inhalation? That means for the most part, carbon monoxide, which is the same gas that comes out of the exhaust pipe of a car, okay? Uh, 210 times more likely to be used by your body than the regular oxygen, okay? So your body 
would, if it had a choice between carbon dioxide and oxygen, okay, it would take carbon dioxide 210 times more than oxygen. So it gets into the bloodstream very easily. Hydrogen cyanide is another popular. Hydrogen cyanide? Yeah, because that's all your synthetic plastics and stuff like Ooh. that are burning. So that's in your bloodstream, okay? So if, if he ends up at the hospital uh, with a minor, relatively minor burn, they're actually more worried about the smoke inhalation in most cases in the hospital than they are the minor burn because they literally have to uh, get him get the get the CO carbon dioxide and the hydrogen cyanide out of his bloodstream. What that means is giving him major doses of oxygen. That might include in some cases we use hyperbaric chambers now uh, to like infuse oxygen to people to get that smoke a problem out of them. Even if they seem fine, they, they don't. Be. They always first thing is they do a blood test and they check for that. Okay. So um, we always check for that because they, you can actually detect the carbon dioxide in the blood. So that's what the hospital will be doing. Oh my God, he was you know smoke inhalation victim. Okay, they're going to do a quick blood analysis, blood gases. They're going to look to see if he's got carbon dioxide. And if they see that, they're mainly putting him on oxygen therapy right away. Now, the part of the heart attack part of it, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. I can imagine that a stressful event in which you've been burned to some extent and you've got CO in your body, that somehow that could trigger a heart attack. I guess it could. If he had some pre-existing condition, I would imagine high cholesterol, plaque development, blocked arteries, maybe that's a possibility. All right, Glenn, I feel exhausted and anxious. Okay. Will you just please recap for me and yes. everybody else yeah. what the Pearsons should have done in okay. the fire? Okay, so let's roll through this. This is true of any family, right? So, yes. so uh, you first develop a plan, okay, uh, for how you're gonna deal with a fire in your house, okay? We talk about where the fires could start in the kitchen or in the basement, in the bedroom. You walk through- How do you do ahead. this without scaring kids? Um, we do it in a way, because we do this actually in the fire departments do this. We have a fire prevention week every year. It's the first week of October because it actually is the anniversary of the great Chicago fire of 1871. That's where it comes from. So every year in October, we go to every elementary school in this country and we give it to them in a palatable form. But what's really interesting about it is most fire departments will actually make the kids like emissaries to their houses because we'll give them flyers and we'll tell daddy and mommy be really good if they had a plan. And then of course they go home and tell mommy, you have to be That's really smart. good to me and stuff. So we get them to actually do the plan okay. in their house. All right, so, so they talk them through it and we talk about how, how it could be very bad right? But the fact is that we can still survive this if we do certain things. So having a plan of how, how they're going to deal with the fire, okay, that we know that, for example, if they're in their bedroom at night, uh, before, the, if, they, if they smell smoke or they want to try to get out or whatever, that's the natural inclination. They don't just run to the door and open it and run out, right? They actually go to the door, feel the door, yell, of course, yell to their parents and stuff like that. Feel the door if it's hot or if they see smoke coming in, they should stay where they are, right? Um, that the parents would do the same thing for all intents and purposes, uh, all intents and purposes. Um, but we tell them what sort of, it's more, it's more like what not to do kind of stuff than it is what to do. Right. Okay. So, so let's, so, so, uh, so don't open doors, you know, at, at night when you sleep, it's always best actually, if you can, um, close doors at night because it is, does provide compartmentation in a house. So it does take time for, for fire, particularly to burn through a door. We, we're actually, even in the fire service, we actually now, we go into a house. Uh, to search for trap victims. Of course, at two o'clock in the morning, we're going to the bedrooms first because that's the logical place. So we may climb up a ladder through the bedroom window. The first thing we do when we get in that bedroom is close the bedroom door because that buys us time basically, <laughs> okay? Um, get to the window, open the window, yell, scream, the whole bit. That's what, they, what we should tell children to do. The natural inclination for parents is to get to that child. Don't be a hero. Get don't be out. a hero. If, if, you, if there's a raging fire in the hallway, okay, don't try going that way because you're going to not only... You're not only going to kill yourself, but you're going to endanger the children as well, okay? Because you're actually going to spread the fire into the, into the room that you're coming from, too. So the thing is, is that try to yell. I mean, of course, now with cell phones and stuff like that, maybe it's easier to call between rooms and stuff like that. But again, you don't have, this is, we're talking about like two or three minutes here. We're not talking a lot amount of time. So you got to be ready for this, right? So we, we practice the drill, or of course, we develop the drill, what to do, what not to do. How do we listen for smoke detectors, feel the door, crawl low, as we talked about earlier. That's another thing, too. If you're going to have to get through a fire out of a smoky area, the closest to the floor as possible, crawl like a baby across the floor. 
um, have a meeting space outside, a tree out front or something. We're all gathered together to make sure that every person is out of the house. And if they're not, as soon as the fire departments get there, say, hey, my daughter's missing, my wife's missing, or whatever, where they're logically might be located and stuff. So it's because that helps guide I just thought of one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dial 911. Right, right. We didn't talk about it. Right. right. So, okay, so, so smoke detector battery. Right. So, dial 911. Terms of the, right. So, we want to make sure that the smoke detectors are working in your house, carbon oxide detectors you should have in your house as well, uh, that you replace the battery. We do it annually during Fire Prevention Week. Change your clock, change your battery. It's another time we do it during the year. We put posters up for that. So if you change your clock, it's another time to change the battery in a smoke detector. We're getting new detectors with lithium batteries now. They're 10 years. Uh, so we're getting better technology out there too. But they've been incredibly successful the last 30 years. I mean, we've saved probably at least three or 4,000 lives nationally because of smoke detectors. So they're, they're wonderful devices. Uh, so again, smoke detectors, the plan in place, and of course, call 911. The first thing you do is get on the cell phone, address, name, uh, who you are, what's going on. Basically, the dispatcher will very often ask for that information, stuff like that. And then the fire department will be rolling. Literally, as they're typing information up, they'll be sending the apparatus there and stuff. So uh, that's the best thing for a successful outcome, you know. Uh, in a tragic story like this and everything, yeah. this is the best way to deal with it. But again, the takeaway here is don't believe what you see on TV as being realistic. It isn't. It's a drama. The realistic stuff is it's it's much more dark and dangerous than than you could ever imagine. Um, and so the best thing to do is be prepared. Smoke detectors, plan in place where we're going, and then calling 911 right away. So thank you, Glenn. No problem. It, it still won't bring Jack Pearson back to life. It but might. It may have saved a life. So we might if we gave him an idea for storyline to bring him back in exactly. some dream sequence or something. So. Thank you so much. We've, no problem. We've, we've burned up our time. We I'm have. Sorry, literally. I'm sorry. Literally. It was right there.